So hello everyone and a huge thank you for joining us today for a discussion on demystifying databases for developers. This is a lead dev webinar created in partnership with Timescale. The webinar will last roughly for 45 minutes after which both myself and the panelists will head over to the lead dev Slack to answer some of your questions in the continuous learning channel. We may also have time to answer a couple of questions live. So please do submit, the, do submit those through the Q&A feature on Zoom, and we'll get to them if we can towards the end. So let's get started with some introductions. My name is Blanca, and today I'll be joined by Shinran, Mike, and Anthony to share their experiences and insights. I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Let's go in alphabetical order by name. Could you please answer in 60 seconds who you are and what makes you excited about being on the panel today? Anthony, would you go first? Yeah, so that's the curse of having a name starting with an A. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my name is Anthony. Uh, I work at the BBC as a senior engineer in tests. And um, I've been incredibly lucky to have a team which allowed me to explore many, many things, uh, like from DevOps to like databases to pretty much like a whole realm of things. And databases, you know, in general, of data has just become kind of like such a huge part of my life now that um, every time I got a chance to, to talk about it or a chance to listen to what other people have to say about it, I find it incredibly interesting. And, and it's kind of fascinating to see options and solutions from everywhere. And I'm also super excited to be here because it's my first time doing this kind of thing. So thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and now, Mike? You're mute. And I was muted. See, first mistake of the uh, of the webinar. There you go. Uh, my name is Mike Friedman. I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO at Timescale. Uh, and I'm actually, for the last 15 years, I've also been a professor of computer science at Princeton. Um, Timescale, I could talk more broadly about it, but uh, in general, uh, we're, we are a, a cloud database company. We started building um, a database specifically focusing on things like supercharging Postgres for time series events, analytical to build a real-time kind of operational database to serve applications. More broadly, we offer kind of a supercharged Postgres for the cloud when people need scalable production services they build on top of that. Um, how I got into data, I mean, I mentioned that I was a professor for, you know, the last 15 years, I've always been working on uh, distributed systems, data systems, super interested in building things that are highly reliable and highly performant. And that led to the natural trend of we saw, you know, all this data with, with modern, you know, data-driven applications. Almost to be a modern application, you have to be data-driven and data-intensive. Um, and then the question is, is how do you provide this amazing seamless experience for developers so they could focus on building their applications as opposed to worrying about the low-level technical details, however much fun that is, uh, or the ins and outs of making their systems reliable. And they could you know, focus on solving the product questions, business problems that they have. Amazing, thank you. And last but not least, Xinran. Hey everyone, my name is Xinran and currently I work as a senior data engineer at Netflix. So I personally have uh, worked as a data engineer for about seven years now. I previously worked at different industry as well, um, such as a startup called Confluent and also Target. Um, Target was actually my first job after I graduate. And my personal experience with data, it all started with my internship where I had to manage a relational database. And that was the first time I ever worked with data. And I just immediately fall in love. I thought, this is so much more interesting than writing web application. So after I graduated, I have been on my data engineering path and I'm still loving it. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. So uh, developing software products involves most of the time some form of data storage and management. Back when I started working in tech, the, the role of database administrator was fairly common. Nowadays, this role is very much a specialist role and most product engineering teams don't have one. So how can we as engineers get the depth of knowledge and experience needed to understand the ins and outs of database management systems? During our panel today, we're going to be touching on some of the key areas that engineers will want to be aware of. Some of them might be common issues with data at scale, tackling data quality problems, how can engineers keep databases healthy, and breaking and preventing uh, knowledge silos in data. So without further ado, we're gonna keep things off with Shinran. Uh, 
Can you tell us what types of data storage uh, do you work with and what's the most common problem you encounter? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I actually started my career as a software engineer and I was mm -hmm. doing a lot of web application and um, automated testing at the point. And my first time I had deal with data was actually a relational database that's called Microsoft SQL Server, uh, where we store all the results data for our website tests. And when I had to, when I was working on that job and my first project that's related to that database, at first I started just writing simple queries, trying to get some kind of results, trying to figure out what kind of data we have in store. But very soon enough, we start to run into issue where writing one ranker to data can take 10 minutes. And that was my first exposure of data problem at scale. And we realized it was taking so long to write the data. It was because that we have so many unnecessary index built in the table that we don't even use. And that was my first entry point of start realizing that when you are not designed the database carefully for the use case you have in mind, you can run to a lot of issue when it's come to operation and maintaining. Um, actually, I don't work a lot with relational database these days anymore because mm -hmm. they're usually uh, the upstream of data engineering team. So for the most of my full-time career as the data engineer, I mostly work with OLAT, OLAP kind of database such as NoSQL or Data Lake where the database storage is optimized for query long history of data and build with distributed system. And the most common problem, honestly, we run into a lot is a small file problem. So to kind of give more light into that, so small file problem usually happens that you are writing a lot of very small files to the underneath storage of your database. And it could be quite common. And there's a couple of common you know, calls for that. One is that if you're writing to the storage um, from a streaming uh, job, so the streaming job, because you can have late arriving data. So you might have a really long tail that let's say currently what 9 a.m. in the Pacific time. So right now the streaming job, it can have late arriving data even from maybe a month ago, really depending on how your system work or whether you're filtering this out. So as a result, you might be running, you might be writing a lot of small files, so many different partition. And that can be detrimental to both write performance and read performance in the sense that creating those files, hold those files uh, in space could be taking a lot of processing memory that you could be using for processing data. As a, as a result, it could make your streaming process to stall. And most common kind of uh, problem you see with small file problem is the read performance. When your user have to read uh, a lot of small files, when you're scanning all those partitions that's um, uh, used for their query, there can be a lot of overheads, no matter what uh, engine you are using. So that can cause very um, slow read query as well. So when it comes to solution for this problem, um, honestly, I have seen many different uh, databases or query engines um, handle it in a different way. Sometimes that when you're writing the data, you could do some level of batching. So in the sense that you are sacrificing some latency to so that you have bigger file, but also you know some um, data lake formats such as Apache Iceberg or Hoodie, they might have some kind of operation or management um, function you can use to merge the files together after it's being written so that the read performance can be improved and the user actually get to use that data. Sometimes you even use some technique like clustering to make it easier to merge the data together without scanning too many files. So anyway, to summarize, you know, in the big data world distributed system, I would say the most common problem we run into is small files. Thank you, thank you, Simran. And because you started talking about your first exposure of, of data, I'm, I'm gonna move to Anthony and, and ask you what, what was the most uh, daunting task you ever faced when you started working with databases? So the most daunting task was um, basically I used to do like some automation testing on like API and NoSQL database, like DynamoDB and stuff. I knew my thing, I was pretty straightforward, liked it. And then suddenly someone turned to me and said, hey, how about you design like a brand new uh, test strategy for like, you know, migrating our Redshift database into completely different cluster nodes and and just changing everything that we had. It's like, okay, 
well, hold on, that's just a different type of SQL database, and I don't know very much. I, I didn't know anything at all at the time. I was, and I was thinking, how do you performance test this thing? Like, you know, can you just like time SQL queries, but then with the hot caching, I mean, the more you run it, the more the faster the query is. So I kind of skews the, the, the results. Um, they all had like, lots of unknown part to it. And I did the thing that, you know, we always do as like developers is that you have a, a problem and you solutionize a problem. So I knew that I wanted to find that, you know, uh, if we had some like, you know, storage issues, if we had like CPU usage issue, and if overall the amount of query we would run on this new type of clusters and this new redshift cluster will actually be faster on average than what we had in the past. So basically just, it was a, a huge hurdle, so I had to go and talk to a lot of people to learn about, you know, the database, how it performs. A lot of reading on the AWS documentations and finding out how, you know, the, the hot and cold, hot and cold caching actually worked. And um, yeah, lots of like, you know, bits and trimmings, new functionality introduced by like uh, AWS, such as like um, I don't even remember the name. So <laughs> there was so many things. I needed to be taken into account. And I started from, from nothing, from literally walking in with like a, a, no, a no SQL database experience into like a, a brand new SQL world. But I spoke a lot with data scientists and, you know, they kind of walked me through the things they did. They usually, like, I, I made friends with, with someone and uh, they, they just shared with me. And thankfully, like, you know, that woman, she was just so, can I say this? She just loved the query so much that she would time them to time them religiously and then I had already a benchmark thanks to her of like the last three months of her queries so I just used that to actually just started testing on the new cluster and I was so happy to get back to it and say look you saved 12 minutes on all these queries how amazing is that um so so that was basically the, the the biggest hurdle is the more you do it the more you learn about it and after six months of doing it People were starting to ask me questions about, you know, how Redshift work, how did the migration went, what to look for when you're testing, you know, what is considered like bloating in like um, the metadata layer of Redshift, you know, like how's, how, what's the size of your catalog? Is it too big? Is it too small? And, and all of these tiny little details that I just suddenly was made aware of. And then I tried to impart that knowledge back to that other developers. So, so it can be done. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. I, I love the keeping data about data. <laughs> now we're gonna we're gonna move on to to Mike. Um, what what is in your experience the most frustrating issue for a team managing a database at scale, and how can they mitigate it? You're muted. Yeah, so it was uh so it was interesting in that you know I heard um in a lot of the discussions that uh Shinran and Anthony both gave were talking about when I think about what performance issues and and what things people care about. Um, I actually often separate what I view as like the application level concerns from the developers and the really operational issues. And so when you might think application level concerns, how how uh, performant is my ingest? How are my queries performing? I think somebody mentioned, you know, Anthony was talking about regressions, performance regressions of like, as we go through like changing even our data modeling or changing what index, I think Shannon mentioned having too many indexes um, how we measure that, how we track it versus like traditional operational issues, which is also as a big DBA function that you mentioned, Blanca, you know, it's everything from a high availability and disaster recovery and resizing and, uh, and backup restore and, and, and making sure you have all that and upgrades, making sure you have all that right. And I think that actually kind of leads to, um, even the balance of of when people want to manage these things themselves and what things people look towards in an in increasingly kind of cloud world where developers are sometimes looking for full solutions where again they could focus on what's important to them. And you know, I think for example, you know, developers will continue to you know define their data modeling either individually or through ORMs, and they will need to, they will know what type of queries they do. And, and we can look to what type of support you can get from the infrastructure. But, you know, one of the things like that, you know, timescale offers in, in providing a, a super large Postgres platform is trying to take away that operational complexity so that developers could focus on their applications as opposed to that thing. And you mentioned like, what are the frustrations of operating at scale? In some sense, it's like, what isn't the frustrations of operating on scale? You know, uh, Jin Ran mentioned the problem with 
small files. And like what you realize at scale, everything becomes a file. In fact, your operating system will eventually run out of open file descriptors when you do this. You know, you know, there's always the the uh you know one thing that you encounter is um I think the danger some people say, oh, I spun off this, you know, great technologies like Docker, make it super easy to spin up like a helm chart and we can get something up and running. And sometimes that leads to uh, maybe a false confidence of what it actually means to operate kind of mission critical infrastructure um, at, at scale, as opposed to just spin something up. Um, and so I, I think another thing I would add is, um, you know, I think um, uh, Jinran also mentioned moving from uh, relational database serving customers versus data infrastructure. And a lot of times like, you know, data warehouse se serving centralized um, data teams. And I think it's actually important that when you go through this journey, you understand, you know, what the reliability, what the true like reliability you need. Uh, Timescale operates in an interesting use case as dealing with a lot of time series and event data. Because on one hand, that type of event data, that type of time series analytics are often similar to types of data you have in data teams. But on the flip side, the purpose of that is actually to serve often customer facing applications. You know, um, it's not how the, you know, in, internal teams at Netflix are gonna figure out their monthly revenue calculations. It might be actually part of their website that you actually use to serve real-time information to your own customers. And, and as such, even though your pipelines might look like data coming in in an ingesting fashion, backfill, all that stuff sounds very familiar. It's actually meant that you want the data to be available within milliseconds of hitting it, and it should be served in real time to all your customers. So again, it it leads to situations where having any forms of downtime, you know, even in 30 seconds of downtime is really unacceptable to businesses. And so what we, you know, what we, um, kind of the way we think about it is that you know, when something is mission critical, you know, it does require really a high degree of effort and experience to solve this problem. And especially for the long tail of what can go wrong, especially at scale, when a database gets into the hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, tens of terabytes or more. I mean, under those, like, you could say, well, I have a backup restore. Well, multi terabytes, even restoring your database could take 12, 24 hours, even days. Um, when you start calculating even the raw throughput coming off of Spain disk. So you have to start thinking about like all the richness of what you need for your infrastructure to support it. And from that perspective, we often think that it'd be better. I mean, I'm I'm talking my book a little bit here, but I do fully believe that it's better to then offset those things to companies like Timescale or um, things like AWS RDS and allow developers to really focus on building their applications and and you know, even making those applications better through various testing. I could talk more about um, various thoughts about how we could have even system support for um, better testing through better system abstractions. But yeah, um, at scale is is hard, and the uh, sometimes the right solution is not to uh, always think you're going to solve everything yourself. I think. Thank you, Mike. That that was a, a really, really good summary. And and I, I couldn't agree more with you. Like the ev everyone's been engulfed in cloud. And I think Shimran uh wants to add something uh to what you just said. Wanna go ahead? Yeah, I want to add that honestly from a data engineer perspective, like no matter you are doing event time streaming or it's a batch based uh use cases, um, you know, let's say like some of the use cases that Mike mentioned that let's say you have to serve some real-time analytics to your user. For example, maybe let's say in Uber's use case, they have to serve how many tips that drivers get um, mm -hmm. as the users updated more tips for them. I would say like in that case, latency is definitely, and also accuracy is definitely a main concern because you want to make sure that you're showing the user the most accurate number and they don't want to be wondering, okay, why am I still, it's not, why is the tip on this page not matching the other? But also at the same time, another use case Mike mentioned talking about like maybe a batch use case, such as when you are doing financial report. But to to that case, even though maybe latency isn't the biggest concern in that use cases, but however, 
having that data accurately and consistently across different reports and having that source of truth can also be mission critical in the sense that you don't want to show one number in one report versus another. So I just want to add that, you know, no matter the latency or uh, is a problem or not, it's always important. It's always mission critical to serve uh, accurate source of truth when it comes to data. Thank you, Simran. I think you you've ni you nicely stepped in, into the next topic we wanted to touch on in, into our webinar, which is data quality. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be asking Anthony uh, first. Uh, how do you go about detecting data quality issues, or or what has been your experience in the past? So data quality is a very vast topic, and um, several kind of layers or means to implement it. I think uh, in, in the organization I've worked for, there is not really like um, a definition of what looks good. We, we would love to have one, but I don't think it's ever really been determined somewhere. And um, at present, you know, there's, there's things you can control, you know, like as, uh, as you, know, you have pipelines that you have control over, you have things that you, know, you look after. Like, for example, you know, like, um, both Shivan and Mike were talking about, like, you know, this uh, mission critical data. Like, I'm just going to use that like, personalization for the BBC, for example, as an example of like, something that needs to be retrieved instantly. And just like, I'm pretty sure it's the same about Netflix when you personalize an account. You need to have this data there accurately. So, we, we have some, some data validation checks in place because they're light. And, you know, the data has been coming in already from trusted source and is coming back out to a trusted source. So, you know, that's very light touch on the data quality. However, when you reach, for example, like Redshift uh, and you have like lots of analysts that suddenly wants to query, uh, you know, business intelligence things. Is my program doing well? You know, what's your what's viewership? What's, you know, uh, what's this and that? Then suddenly you start getting into the realm of people creating their own table using the table is already existing. So they're gonna take the data, do their own transformation, and then just spit out new data, all of that within your database. And unfortunately, you have very little control over this um, because you have to trust them entirely to be able to do that. And the, a way we've been looking at it is to um, to try um, with like, things like DBT or Elemently, where we would encourage people to start like testing the SQL scripts before they actually, like in a mock environment, before they start firing them against the Redshift cluster. Because every time you run a query, you obviously eat out some of our kind of like, you know, CPU power, queue system. And it's all become like, you know, if you messed up, then, you know, there's a risk of like, sometimes seeing someone scanning trillions of rows and wondering why it takes four hours and everyone everything is down. Um, so yeah, so we try to encourage people to to build their own data quality layer or their tests early on, and and yeah, like I was, and the other part is the things you have control over. I mean, not just for like personalization and immediate data, but for like other third party pipelines coming through. There's like you know more data validation rules. The two things we notice that people are really concerned about is the freshness of data. They always want like timestamps to know when was this process, when was the last batch. And the second thing is obviously the lineage of the data. Where does that data come from? Like the trusted source. So we used a lot of like, we used Data Hub a lot um, because it had like some nice features on the data catalog. We were really hoping to get people on that data catalog to start to understand this is what we have in store. This is where it's coming from. Uh, this is how fresh it is. Perhaps that can help you. Um, but unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. And I'm, I'm sure there's like other leads to explore, but. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of data quality, the key takeaways for, for users like the freshness and the trusted source with lineage. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Mike uh, for, for his take on how how can you detect data anomalies uh early on and what approach uh, or approaches do you recommend it following? Yeah, I mean I think I think going back to the same framework in that I mentioned before about, you know, what are the things that we, that are part of the developer's job and kind of think in knowing their, understanding their applications and how do we support that? And what are the things that we want to provide more operationally um, to avoid anomalies? And, and I think of, 
I mean, you could think about database versus database anomalies or data versus database. And I mean, obviously our goal is to take away all that operational complexity, you know, from, mm -hmm. from users. So they don't have to think about, I mean, that includes performance anomalies due to like underlying infrastructure. And you, you kind of want to make your um, infrastructure sometimes proactive to, you know, route around problems you're seeing in the, in underlying, you know, uh, infrastructure. Um, I, I think from an application perspective, there's there's a couple things. And let me also more broadly talk on some of the touch on some of these issues that were brought up around even data freshness. Um, the first thing is to give people, you know, appropriate tools. And so in in even though we are built on on Postgres, you know, we really make it for kind of analytical, um, kind of in real time use cases, so that a lot of what people end up doing are um, use cases that it, it, in other cases would be for, for these non kind of operational settings would also be using things like Redshift or warehouses or whatever. And so one of the things that we do is just provide a lot of easier functions in terms of ways to automatically build. Um, some people call them rollups. If you're in database world, you might call them um, incremental, incrementally materialized views if you want to get very mm -hmm. technical. Uh, we sometimes call them continuous aggregates. So you could think about that as you might set up a rule saying, um, I think we, I think uh, uh, Shinran mentioned uh, about, you know, you want the average, the tipping to be correct, or even your your rollups from a finance perspective to be correct. And you, um, you know, and these are use cases where like, let's say, unlike, let's say a lot of ad hoc data warehousing, where you really throw the data somewhere, you don't really know what people want to do with it. And your job is to just like throw all your data in there and just worry about it later. I think in those operational settings, you often have a better idea of the type of questions that people want to ask, often because they're serving either real-time internal dashboards or even customer-facing information. And so by that, you could basically define rules in basic SQL. You could write SQL statements. And then these are basically views. These are, these are computations that happen continuously already in the database. And then you could serve your APIs just on those pre-rolled up data, right? Mm -hmm. And so one, it actually takes away the performance hit because you pre-rolled it up. Um, but 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 what's interesting that I want to want to touch on, which is I think one of the unlocks from us for anomalies, and I think we heard before about data freshness and late data, is that again going back to when you operate at scale, you always have data coming late. For sometimes that's I mean think about in 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 IoT settings, in product analytics, in in fintech, in all these things, you know, there's this long tail of occasionally when when data comes in late. Or I said before, all the problems are about the long tail, you know, and your the complexity of your solutions are about handling the tail, not about handling your normal case. So in Timescale's case, we actually um, handle those things automatically because internally, whenever we get late data. We actually, in some sense, internally track, you can think of this as lineage related to what time periods that data is about and what calculations depend on that data. So if you have an, a financial update that came in a week late, but it's about data from last week, we know that this roll up about that weekly, weekly answer, which depended on it, gets recomputed. And we kind of track that a fine granularity so like we don't have to redo the entire computation, which would be way, way too expensive. And we could just basically recalculate um, the precise things that it depends on that region of updated data. Um, and so really avoids, uh, it's not necessarily about anomalies, but again, is infrastructure or is tooling that ex extra uh, abstracts away some of the complexity that a developer would have in solving this themselves, particularly in getting an accurate fresh answer, which otherwise would lead to application confusion if they don't have it. So we found that to be an incredibly powerful tool for a lot of our, our users. Um, and they could even mix and match them and build hierarchy. So it makes very, becomes very easy to go from raw data to minutely data to hourly to daily. And all of these things build on top of each other and can even be queried in in SQL at, at query time to, again, um, build the type of queries and applications that you want.
Thank you, Mike. I I feel that you kind of just described it. One of the kind of biggest time consumers for data teams, <laughs> which is really, we process this late data. Well, we've heard this enough from our own users. So, you know, like know. both in open source and, and, and customers, when you hear this from you know, thousands and thousands of, of teams again, you kind of get a sense of what 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 they what their pains really are. So yeah. <laughs> uh Shinran, uh, you have mentioned before uh using data contracts at Netflix. Uh can you tell us more uh, about how they work? Yeah, definitely. You know, when it comes to data quality, I would say data freshness and or what we call SLA is definitely an important part of it because you want to make sure that your data is available and arrive within the latency for your use cases. But also, also important aspect is, is making sure the data that you are getting actually reflect the truth of certain part of your business because when it doesn't, then you are using that data to making certain decisions that actually doesn't align with your expectation. And when it comes to um, data quality life cycles, um, from data engineering perspective, honestly, I think there's three parts of it. Uh, one is define your data quality, and second is monitor your data quality, which is we also call it detection. And the third, honestly, to me, is a very important part is prevention, which is where data contracts come to in place. Because every data set you work with can be very unique. This could be a fact table of all the orders coming from people if you're working in a retail perspective, or it could be a reflection of all the subscriber you have if you're working in entertainment. So from a def definition perspective, first of all, is understand that what is this data being used for? And for all those use cases, what's the latency requirement from data freshness and what's the expectation from the user? So first of all, um, it's important to define data quality given the use cases and users you have in mind. And also secondly, um, data quality is never a one-time issue that once you build a system, you do one-time check and assuming everything will be perfect from now on. Data quality detection and monitoring need to be a consistent effort. And to me, it has to be built as part of your system to making sure that every time this data is being produced or processed, you have some kind of measure as part of your system to monitor the quality. It could be something simple as, hey, we have all the columns we need. And in this column, they have certain category values or this column, you have to have values within certain range. And having all those check is very important. And also you can have some kind of data freshness check to see what's the average, um, data latency per uh, per event we're processing here. So that's one aspect of uh, per, uh, detection and monitoring data quality as part of your system. And when it comes to the question about data contract, that's when it comes to prevention, because when you don't have prevention measure in place, then what your data engineering team is going to run into all the time is that you're going to be on fire all the time. Today, something went wrong, your pipeline got broken or your user reports some issue to you. You're constantly passively reacting to those issues and in the, knowing that in the future, it could be breaking again. And that's where data contract become really important is to establish some kind of contract uh, programmatically with your upstream to make sure that they are logging the data or creating the data, meeting the expectation, uh, meeting the, your expectation as well. To be kind of practical, give you some examples. It can come to many different forms depending on where your data come from or what kind of data you're consuming. You know, honestly, it could be a file, maybe your third party window drop on FFTP server and you had to ingest that data and you want to make sure that, hey, it has all uh, the columns you need and do some schema check. Um, or it could be much more complicated in the case that maybe it's your internal software engineering system or backend or Microsoft service of your website that is logging all this issue, let's say, to keep track of users' behavior and how they're interacting with your UI. And honestly, that is one challenge we run into at Netflix here, is that how do we make sure that the logs we're receiving and consume the data engineering team is actually a representation an accurate representation of what the user is doing on UI. And to ensure that data contract, we need some kind of programmatic measure built in to making sure that every time if the upstream team uh, push any changes that might impact the data, it's still uh, a 
align with the data contract we have placed. And a lot of times I see it's, uh, data contract is built as unit test or integration test, or maybe a third party tools that help you do some of the validation. For example, uh, a very simple example is that let's say if you're having your data arriving as a Kafka topic, you can have schema registry to help you check those data and making sure that all the data uh, meeting the expectation of the predefined schema. But yeah, but you know, to summarize that, you know, data contract, I would say is the prevention part of the data quality. And it's really important in the sense that you can proactively making sure that data you're getting is actually reflecting the truth of what you and your user expected. Thank you, Shane Brown. I, I find that you've, you've been talking about, a, you know, a long time ago when I was an engineer in, in a data team and that reactivity, that daily failures of things and just being on this contest like hamster wheel is fixing something but you don't, you already know the next pipeline has broken and, and that's that's just we learned a lot uh, at that time and the systems we built later on uh, were dramatically different but it, it, the pains are still kind of the scars are still there <laughs> so now we're gonna we're gonna move on to the to the next topic uh, we're gonna touch on today uh, which is about improving the health of databases so maybe um, a bit of Mike's insight. Uh, again, you know, what what are the uh, some strategies, practices that your engineering team employs to improve the health and reliability of databases? Yeah, so um, I think there's there's two aspects of this. One is, um, you know, I could interpret that as what do we internally? I mean, obviously, we do we do a lot internally, given that you know we. Um, you know, we manage databases for thousands of customers at, at scale. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into the infrastructure we do internally, as well as the, you know, follow the sun, you know, we have ops and support teams all around the world. And so that we could provide that 24 seven level of, of, um, operations and support that, you know, customers trust with you. But I think the question that maybe that's better is what should teams be doing themselves? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the developers that they could focus on their health and reliability or how they would better understand. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that it has encountered is that as software has become, you know, more and more complex and what's great is the level of abstractions we now provide people to, to hide that complexity. The problem is that performance is a subtle thing. And so even though like you have these abstractions with high complexities, if you're not careful because you're sometimes trying to do complex things, um, you don't, it sometimes could be hard to understand what's going on under the covers to, is to, or either to understand or to have, have enough visibility. And so I think that there's really three things that we found. One is, um, you know, developers seeing databases as a, as a black box is a problem. And, and that's even especially true given all the, the rise of ORMs, um, and particularly because you know ORMs were started for like really simple CRUD interfaces. You know, I just want to do a bunch of get and puts against my database, and not surprisingly, people always want a little bit more, a little bit more, and so they've always they've almost built in this like pseudo query language that you know that then maps to then more complex SQL queries. And one thing that we encountered is often those ORMs are doing things that the developers don't really expect or know, or because again, it's one ORM that promises, we're gonna abstract this away from like 20 different databases. Well, they're often sometimes create anti-patterns for different databases. And so one of the things that we, we recommend is when people ever come into issues that they don't really understand or it seems strange to um, basically try to differentiate what is an ORM problem from a from the database itself. And so that could be like either try to write the same query directly in SQL or just print out the SQL that the ORM is writing. First of all, checking that it looks right, but then also trying to issue it directly rather than through the ORM layer, you know, issue it directly through your database shell and seeing if you have very different results. Because that's a that's a, a, a key part of where we see some of that um, issue going on. The second general pattern that kind of I like to recommend is think more about uh, integration testing, about performance testing. Because for applications, you know, yeah, unit testing is going to be like red or green. Is it working? Is it not working? 
But for many users, if all of a sudden something used to take 10 milliseconds and now it takes two seconds, that almost looks like a perform that looks like an application problem, or it could even lead to a timeout that makes the application look unavailable. And so that is actually sometimes easier said than than done, because often a query against your toy database that's constructed, you know, a simple 10, 10 row table that is auto-generated with your database migration script doesn't encounter this. But then when you try to run the same thing against your 100 gigabyte database, you encounter that that often. So what, you know, and, and one thing that we do and whether or not you use Timescale or another, uh, another provider or self-managed would recommend is that we actually have ways where people either could fork their production databases or even run what we call their form of asynchronous read replica, but it's like a testing replica. So it's actually continually, it's kept up the date from people's primary databases, but it's not attached at all to the primary. It's served through some decoupled underlying log. So it doesn't impact the performance of people's production infrastructure at all. And then you could do all of your testing against what is what looks like prod. And so you it would any performance implications that you'd see against this are something that are great to test before you run your any changes of what queries you put into production, any schema changes, whatever you want to roll it in. So we think about using that as really a powerful form of, of performance um, regression testing that should be part of your CI, CD um, strategy. And I think a third thing is um, actually a really powerful capability that we rolled out in the last couple months was um, we actually created this ability for us to um, log information about effectively every query that you do against your production database using very low level um, tools in your in the operating system that you wouldn't normally have in your database. And so we could log these low level infrastructure and then in your database console, in your UI, we actually provide uh, information about all these queries. And so some people have this notion of slow queries, but this is really about every query. The problem with slow queries is in most systems, what a slow query is, is does it take more than five seconds? Well, sometimes you have queries that says, I'm going to process a terabyte of data that takes more than five seconds, right? Or 10 terabytes of data. Um, but other cases, it's like the, the move from the change of what the 90th percentile is what you're really interested in, even if that's only from 20 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. And so by actually having a live information that does, that collects data about all your queries, then then could provide models and all the things. Not only is it about testing, but we actually could show you about how all your systems operating production. And so that's a very well, a great way to really understand the health of, of somebody's database. Are, you know, do any, anom going back to your question before, are any anomalous behaviors starting to, fe starting to form uh, and detect that early and then figure out how to mitigate it? Thank you, Mike. I, I like how, you know, there's a running theme in, in this webinar about testing. Testing everywhere, you know, and data contracts, you know, which is about a bit like test contracts, you know, and and then di different layers. Uh, so thanks for that for that very thorough answer. I'm very conscious of the time, uh, so we're gonna continue, but we might not have time for for all the questions that I had. Uh, so Anthony, now going back to uh, the warehouse, you know, uh, as, as a team that kind of maintains infrastructure, what are the metrics and alerts that you keep track of uh, to know that things are healthy. Maybe more detail about what kind of what Mike, the approach what Mike was was describing overall. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, sure. So basically, like, uh, I really like what I've heard so far, you know, like, uh, from data contracts to like creating those new data environments for, for testing, my son's like, you know, absolutely ideal. And I think the third thing missing is the data culture where you have in your in your company. And and that can be closely linked to to how you monitor things. So at the moment we we have in place some uh, Grafana monitoring. We've got some plugins to like CloudWatch, and then we just get like you know all those like um we have some lambdas with some like you know random not random some chosen cherry picked queries that just look at like queue time and you know what things actually like you know number of like um uh, STL alerts you know just you know it's kind of like um, homemade alerts from Redshift that tells you hey you have a nested loop or hey you know you don't have any um, uh, you don't have any encryption on your tables or whatever so there's lots of um, self-serve information that you can found and then just report on and monitor and just keep track of 
and and that's the basis to start a conversation usually with with your wider community of users and to try to get that that message across um of like hey this is on monday we have about a two hour wait on queue times can everyone stop doing their weekly reporting on the monday like you know is this something you would consider going wednesday to wednesday instead it's just like you know really really silly thing but it tells you a lot about the user's behavior i mean mike mentioned you know something about having like you know a database where it doesn't have a real purpose other than serving like some business intelligence kind of thing and it's a little bit the situation but when you describe it, i found ourselves into is that you know we have this data warehouse where people help themselves to build something but there's not clearly a defined greater projects and and the main, so not the maintenance, but the monitoring part is really here to to help, like telling us, okay, this is where we see the most issues, and what we did on the back of single was was issues just creeping up back and back. We decided to to build like a what we call a data hygiene course, where basically we would use the the re, the most repeating five worst offenders, and just. Try to explain to people, you know, like this is how you create a table, this is how you encrypt, this is how you do this. When you run the query and you do like lots of like, you know, table creation within your query, try to analyze in between so that there's actually some stats so that your query gets faster. Just lots of like, you know, very in-depth details that, you know, we, we managed to find through our monitoring. And and this was well received. We had like a, an amazing training program. We used examples of like us being librarians and <laughs> From being like brands, it's like, you know, if you want the book, well, you come to us and we help you. But, you know, the way you sorted your books, the way you decided it's going to be distributed according to your keys, et cetera, which means it's going to be faster or it's going to be slower. So that training was very well received. And we kind of built like a nice community on the back of that. Um, but unfortunately, as time goes by, you go like, you know, these people just leaves and new people join and they don't have this kind of like, you know, knowledge so we had to to carry on this course and we're trying to find a way to make sure that it's not too heavy as a, like a hey this is a mandatory course you have to do this before you actually go on on use redshift but yeah it's a very tricky situation but the partnership you know using things for basis of conversation to to foster a healthy data culture in your company i think is what is important thank thank you anthony i like how you know you and mike are talking about databases with very very different kind of stakeholders in a way one is, is, is an app that has very low latency you know millions of users you have this data warehouse you know not that many users but very very demanding and now i'm you know in the spirit of time i'm gonna ask Chengran the last the last question of this webinar because she's got another another really interesting use case which is uh writing and reading data from the lake and and i and i wondered in, in this in use case what things do you need to keep in mind to keep a healthy lake and prevent just everything being dumped there because everyone has a sense that it's just infinite. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people think data lake as a data dump, that like you can just dump whatever form of data into a data lake, and that's okay. Um, but the fact is when you have unstructured data and data that's not used or data that's bad quality, you know, the data lake becomes a data swamp. And really for data lake, um, even though that we can allow some level of raw data on process on, on transform the data, that doesn't mean that um, we don't have to apply any kind of data modeling, modeling or optimization on top of it. And to keep your data lake healthy, um, I would say that it's important to have certain uh, tooling or layers of metrics for you to monitor its health. You know, for once is that given all the data quality metrics we have measured, what's the quality of all the data source we have available? And also another aspect, sometimes people forget to talk about, especially become important when at scale, it's also the cost aspect of it. So that will give you more insight of what data are you actually using and what data can we get rid of so that you can keep your cost uh, low as well. And you're not spending all this money on AWS and keeping all this data you are not using. So that's also one important aspect of having a monitor on your data quality and the cost of your data lake. You know, third, but not the least, is that, you know, when it comes to uh, data engineers or whoever's maintaining the uh, data quality, 
or uh, sorry, maintain the data lake and also are responsible for creating or maintain owning all this data in data lake. Um, you know, when it comes to performance optimization or maintaining good, high data quality, it's really important for the owner to understand your use case of the data before you do any of the data modeling or even make a decision of whether we ingest this data or not. Um, so yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Shinra, for, for wrapping up uh, our panel. So now uh, we're going to be wrapping up. Thank you for speaking with us. Uh, so let's go around the room. Uh, and could each of you please share in a sentence, what is your top tip uh, for, someone's, for someone, who, uh, a developer uh, who wants to level up their database skill? It can be a novice, you know, getting to an intermediate level or someone who's an intermediate knowledge and, and wants to become an expert. So now I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order. Uh, would you please go first, Shimran? Yeah, um, honestly, my best advice for whoever want to work with database and really want to optimize their you know, performance database that uh, don't just find, uh, let's say, a cookbook, knowing then how to query the database, and then you start building a data set and start using it. But really, to be able to manage database well at scale, you want to really systematically learn what's the underneath principle or technical concept be behind those database and understanding when you issue a certain query or certain operation, what the database is doing so that you have all those knowledge to design databases and data sets that's optimized for your use cases. And also when it comes to troubleshooting or optimized performance, and then that would give you, the, uh, that would provide you the knowledge that allow you to optimize for the use cases you have in mind or any bottlenecks that you might run into. Thank you. Uh, Mike? I think there's always two things. I think it's important as you get to the next stage of understanding to build kind of a mental model, what, I, what some people call is a mental model of what the system is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then if somehow it's your results are different than what your mental model are saying, there's a mismatch somewhere. Either you need to update your mental model, either you think that the system is doing one thing, it's doing something else. Even you think your query should be doing one thing and they're doing something else. So that really helps you debug it. Like it helps you something is broken and it helps you figure out this is big complex system and it really helps you try to narrow down where your search space should be. The other concrete thing is that databases, we talk often in big distributed systems tracing now, databases, often we think about tracing as component to components, complex distributed systems, how to look at how queries follow those systems. Databases have had the ability to trace queries for a while in the sense that like, what a database is doing is you give it a, a SQL statement, it generates a plan, and then it executes that plan. And a lot of the magic is actually what the plan it will generate is. And the great things is most tools like Postgres and other databases as well, you could just say, explain and then write a query or explain, analyze and write a query. It will both tell you the query and actually run it and tell you timing information, cache it informations. So this is a great way if something doesn't is so is slower, is working differently than it, than it did before, you know, exp, like let the system tell you what it's actually doing, and that again could help you compare to your mental model, and you could really then isolate. Oh, it's because the data set is bigger than it was before, and rather than now sort this in memory, it has to actually do a swap it to disk when it searched, and that's why my query time move from, you know, again, 20 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds. And it really helps a lot to, you know, learn how to read, to run and read these explain plans. Thank you. And Anthony? Yeah, I mean, I really love that, you know, mental image concept of buying, uh, you know, what, what I was equating that to is like, you know, um, problem that you're trying to solve, um, you know, you, you, you're trying to come up with, um, with your data model as an answer to something. Um, you know, uh, it's like, you know, telling someone, write me some Java, but, but I have no idea. They'll ask you, what do you want me to write? It's the same with like database. If you're like, okay, just go and fetch some data, but what kind of data do you want? What's the, what's the problem we're trying to solve? So like every engineer, I think we all have our instincts of like trying to solve a problem. And I would just say like, trust your instinct, go into it, just find something you really want to do with our database, the thing you really want to interact with. And just go and explore, you know, Mike gave some amazing tips about, you know, like the explain and what, what the query will actually look like. But if it was to be with like, you know, JSON messages through APIs or differently, like, you know, there's so many ways 
Uh, if you want to do like streaming technology if you, uh, for like, you know, Kafka clusters, etc. It's, it's just so many interesting topics that are worth just you looking into it. And, like you know, the technological solution will become obvious as you progress in your questioning, in your quest to solve a problem. You realize, hey, streaming is the answer. Hey, no, actually, that is the answer instead. So, yeah, just just go on, explore, solve a problem and you'll wake up a better person. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, my, my tip is uh, start with the questions. What are the questions that your business or your teams need to be answered to the data? And then start going down the layers. And that will tell you what are the requirements from infrastructure to, to modeling, to pipelines, everything in between. Um, so thank you so much all for all the good insights in today's panel. We're going to be heading now to the lead desk Slack in the Continuous Learning channel. Uh, please head there uh, to continue the discussion. Thanks for joining, and we hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.